Wow. It's so, I mean, it's Wednesday. And, and if you don't know, today's St. Patrick's Day. And um, I feel like I have a little connection to this whole holiday, being the Irish guy in this, in this call. So you have no idea how you double down today. Not only are you going to get some really interesting information, I think, I hope, but you're also talking to St. Patrick. So congratulations. You don't even have to wear green. It's a good day. All right, maybe not. I'm not selling this, am I? All right. Um, and I also want to clarify too. Um, so this is uh, this is a going to be a lot of information that I think is is new for folks, and I'm really excited that we're going to go down this route together. Ask questions. I won't be able to see the questions while I'm giving this because I'm in full screen mode for the prezo. But go ahead and ask the questions. I'll leave plenty of time to talk about it afterwards. Um, let's dig in. Let's go into it. I love the Q and A portion almost more than I like doing this. So um, like Marissa said, my name is Patrick McFadden. Um, I do developer relations stuff here at Datastax. I also work quite a bit in our open source side. I do open source strategy, um, spend most of the time giving away software. That's what I do. And I work a lot with open source projects. I work um, with CNCF and I work with the Apache Software Foundation quite a bit. So this is just my world I live in, um, but I'm also, um, an Oracle DBA. Yeah, for a long, long time. And I've been building data-driven apps for, and I said since 19, I'm not gonna tell you when, um, a long time ago. But, you know, and I was just, I was certified as an Oracle DBA um, because that's how you made money back in the day. And, um, you know, that this is part of my journey of working in the application space. And when we started, when I started doing this, it was generally the database was the machine over here. And then you had some other machine that was running your application logic over here and you could actually see them and touch them. And that may sound crazy today, but it meant that you had to really take care of all your infrastructure. So <clears throat> I remember back in like 2000 during the dot-com every pitch, cause I was involved in that dot-com craziness but every company that started the first slide that you showed a VC is how you're gonna build your data center. And because it was such a critical piece of the puzzle. And um, along that line, I wrote a really good book. You should use a database. This is a fake book, by the way, I don't think it's real. But um, I think this is, this is the most obvious thing that everyone says back in the day. I mean, I can't remember applications that were written that didn't need a database. And especially it was when, especially in the dot-com era, when we were like had tens and hundreds of users, we needed a database, but it, every application is data-driven. And because of that, the database is such a critical piece of that, that this is what I'm gonna tell you today is stop using databases because they're too critical. They've gotten way beyond what they need to be for you to be a successful developer or to be an SRE that develops a good application, I'm sorry, that deploys applications into infrastructure. Just stop using databases. That's the end of my talk. I'll take any questions. I'm kidding, I'm gonna prove this to you. So this is like, you know, a good range of applications, right? Is, you know, you have these web and mobile, you, you have microservices out there, IoT, all of these application types require the same thing, a database. And if you've been building, any kind of applications, this is probably similar. This looks similar to the stack that you're building. You know, if it's if it's microservices, you're probably distributing containers all over the place. If you're doing web and mobile, you have like your API gateway with what's happening on your own, you know, using like React JS or I mean sorry, React or some sort of like Swift, something like that on the mobile, but it's always interacting eventually with the database. And um, with IoT, it's pretty much the same, but it's very uh, very bespoke, right? IoT is pouring tons of data into you, a database, time series data into a database. And in every case, that database is kind of the center of the universe for everything. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone has seen this, but someone at one point says data is the new oil. Uh, what is it? Like slippery and expensive? <laughs> yes, it's that. So when we, when we talk about data is the new oil, um, we want to make sure that you know it's it's not this really hard thing to pull out and we built that congratulations everybody um we have 
Okay. Did my slides advance? Oh boy. Hmm. I think we're, are we falling behind here on my slides? You should be seeing an yeah. eye of Sauron at this point, Martha. <laughs> yeah, I'm only seeing the hello, here's my background slide. Really? Eh, hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to kick it. See, this is why we, we're doing it live. Fine. I'm going to reshare. All right, resharing, here it goes. See, I knew that we were gonna be tempting the gods. Can you see that now? <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm gonna try again. I'm gonna hit present, here we go. Okay, so here's my background. Okay, everyone got that, right? And then you didn't, can you see my book now? Yes. Oh, yes. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, see. We're all just traumatized by Zoom at this point. We're not even gonna ask questions. We're like, yeah, Zoom just did this to me. All right, thanks everyone for putting up with me. <clears throat> um, now the pictures of things that I was talking about, I'll just really catch us up here real quick. Um, so yeah, here's my fake book about using a database. And I thought that was kind of funny. And without the visual cue, it's not even funny anymore. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna cry, it's St. Patrick's Day. Let's go get beer. Okay, so I'm telling you to stop using databases. This was the thing I was talking about, like everything that you do has one of these, right? And then this is the slide that I, I was hoping you would see is, and Marissa, do you see a really, really bad, uh, like Eye of Sauron slide? I sure do. Okay, good. See, I'm, <laughs> I'm just gonna keep checking on this. I'm gonna do checksums every like five slides, okay? All right, so, <clears throat> this is the world we live in, right? When the, when the database becomes like this, this, it's tyrannical. It's just like, this is the center of the universe. And we have to like, go ask it, please, can I have data? I wrote this perfectly, perfect SQL statement. And it's like, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> and the issues that we, we've always run into is that developers especially have to really know a lot about databases to use them to be effective and more importantly, to get the most out of it. Um, if you don't, if you're using something like MySQL, um, it's very different from imp implementation from say Oracle. And, um, and if you're using a NoSQL database like Cassandra, also very different. And it require, it puts a lot of knowledge and this, this this thing where you have to go pray to the altar of the database to get the best performance and the best use of that database. Um, I've been working on this for so long. I, I forget sometimes that, you know, I know how to optimize an SQL query for Oracle because I know how to optimize like table scans and row scans. And um, Cassandra, same thing. I know how to build partition keys and clustering columns that are proper that will give you sub millisecond um, performance and works well in a huge thousand node cluster. That's a lot of to expect from somebody who's starting or let's say the first day that they're there. And then, so what we've done is we've created this whole, the order of the sacred DBAs that we all have to like ask very politely. And I was one of those people. Um, this is a group of people that whenever things are not going quite the way you expected them to, uh, that you call and say, hey, Oracle DBA, my query is slow. Um, and I, uh, I, when I'm in, this, in the middle of doing like work as an Oracle DBA, um, I'm in this mode where, hey, um, I'm gonna listen to your question, but I don't think, um, sorry, just a minute. The, uh, when I'm in the mode of being an Oracle DBA, um, I'm gonna be listening to questions and I'm gonna try to answer them. Well, in that mode, I, I'm, in the, I'm just gonna be like, well, I'm gonna help you the best I can, but 
I'm going to be hoping that someone's going to know what they're doing because that's a lot of questions I'm going to get. And you know this if you're a DBA. It's like, hey, how come I'm, you know, my, uh, my query is two milliseconds slower than the last one? Well, I don't know. Let me go check the index or things like that. I mean, it's just a lot of deep knowledge. I and mean, here's when you start learning things like explain plan, right? Um, and then this is, I think this is where we, where we land with using databases is we have these design time trade-offs. Um, design time trade-offs, application, and you know, we're gonna be building our application and it's this meeting, you know, where you're on the whiteboard and you're saying, okay, look, we have this thing, what are we gonna build? And in that meeting, you have to make trade-off discussions. Say, um, what, are my, what are the needs of the application? Uh, what are the scaling requirements? How do I deploy it? And <clears throat> each one of those comes with a trade-off. And the trade-offs usually are your best guess. And sometimes they're not the best, best guess because whenever you deploy it, you learn that, oh, wait, the scaling requirements are completely different or something else. So this is a really hard and probably most stressful part of building your application like in the design phase is just making the right choices. and. Luckily, in 2021, we have better choices that give us less of those problems. Um, and then here's this. Um, it's funny because we're doing this with the Linux Foundation and CNCF. Of course, we love cloud, but y'all love some cloud. And that has changed so much of how we do things now. And running databases now, um, I think from, from a standpoint of cloud and database, not a whole lot has changed. There has been some changes, but you're still probably doing like a bare metal-ish type of deployment. You're still under trying to understand a database, but that is changing. Um, that is hopefully going to change and we're gonna to get to that in a minute. But um, the fact that you're deploying in cloud and you're probably not racking up hardware anywhere because I, I can't even remember the last time I did that. Um, it gives us a whole lot of new opportunities, right? And then Kubernetes. Come on now, that is, it's done. Don't ask questions. Of course it's taken over and for good reason. The thing that I have really started to love about where Kubernetes lands in the, in the grand scheme of building applications is, you know, we've, we've slowly abstracted layers over the years where we went from bare metal to virtual machines to containers. Um, we went from, you know, from bare metal that we install ourselves to instance types, um, then eventually to you know, running containers in the cloud. But now Kubernetes and, and all of those you had to kind of run yourself. Now Kubernetes is abstracting the next layer, which is abstracting entire data centers. You know, Kubernetes is a data center abstraction. It's virtualized data center. So I deployed an entire data center worth of app an application. And <clears throat> it is, really amazing how that is the timing is perfect because it keeps us from getting too locked into one thing like if we want to move from on-prem but that means that we need to really understand the entire picture of deploying an application with something like kubernetes because we're building the entire virtual data center and it needs to be able to hold up to our application needs so this is where we get to the data services so i'm saying stop using databases but use data services and this is a fundamental shift in your thinking, in your deployment, everything. Um, and I'm going to go into why. I don't think this will be too much of a shock, but this is a, this is something that I feel like we need to, uh, as a, a community of application builders and database professionals, we need to start thinking about things in terms of data services, just like how we went from deploying containers on our own data centers to deploying in Kubernetes. So <clears throat> a data service is pretty simple and um, there have been versions of this in the past. This isn't too crazy, but this is, we're getting into more a defined space now. Um, data services are an abstraction layer. Um, the underlying, the, the top line is the APIs that developers need, probably some sort of HTTP API like REST, GraphQL, gRPC. Um, the, uh, SQL, CQL, document, Gremlin, you know, those are protocols that do work um, and can work on your database. However, 
the data service um, really wants to abstract the layer. Like it wants to hide the implementation from the underneath. And um, this is what I think if you look at like the left side, this is probably what you want to use mostly anyway, because you're not thinking when you're using REST, you're not thinking, wow, am I using, you know, am I using the right keys here for an optimized query? Well, that keeps our developers from having to overthink about what's going on below the line. And the below the line is the actual database itself. Um, and yes, we're still using, someone's still using a database, but the data service is abstracting that layer away. And you think about it in terms of how we deploy it, that's where it gets interesting. So, so there's some great examples of these out there. Um, this is, uh, there's, um, So there's a lot of these, uh, you know, out there already. And hang on. So whenever we have, I'm sorry, we got something that happened outside. So Accio is a really interesting project by Facebook. It's a data service that um, has some really cool features, like it, it abstracts as geographics and things like that. Um, at no point does it, the engineers that use it have any idea what database they're using or where it is. And that's the point. They want to bring in uh, engineers that are um, going to be ready to use or to build the front end part of Facebook and Instagram on the first day. They don't want to have them to go through multiple days of uh, learning or multiple months of learning all the back end data systems. That's just not important. And Accio takes away a lot of the really interesting things that, um, that are great for keeping your application online, but developers shouldn't have to worry about like data placement and uh, replication, things like that. So in the, in the, when we're using a database, um, you have some things you can do here. Like for instance, um, you're something you have to do. Like you have to make sure that the driver is installed, that you have to um, initialize that connection to the database. You have to create a prepared statement, then you execute the statement, and then you finally parse and use the result. This is a block diagram, but this is pretty much every database that you use. Um, there are some, you know, there's some details in there, of course, but I mean that's mainly what we have to do every time we want to use a database. It doesn't matter if you're using Node.js or Java or whatever. Um, and I'm going to check, are my, are my slides advancing? Yes, they are. <laughs> OK, so you, know, you have to do that check some. <laughs> so when you use a database, um, this, this is the way it should work, right? Well, what happens when you're using data services? Well, we cut out a lot of that stuff. From here, we're just executing a statement and parsing and using the results. And what this eliminates is a lot of stuff, a lot of the ceremony. We like to call it that, but it's the, am I using the correct driver for the correct database? Um, am I managing my connections properly? And if I'm not, how, what does that do to the database? Uh, you know, if you work a lot with like Oracle, keeping open database connections forever is really a bad idea. Um, and so uh, pooling, connection pooling, that sort of things. It puts a lot of burden inside of your application code. And then eventually for application developers, because all of that gets, you can, you can hide it in implementation, but eventually, you know, there's going to have to be dealt with. And when you're using data services over HTTP APIs, you're, you're just providing an endpoint. And those data services provide um, enough get and put operations so that developers on the front end can just keep moving. And that's what we really want. That's the dream, right? And this, uh, this is a great slide to show, first of all, danger, iceberg, but it's also shows the implementation. Like, this is what we want. We want this top line to look, oh, it's just this cute little iceberg out here. It's very easy to use, but that messy, big mess details underneath is hidden. Um, and so there's, a, there's some stuff happening. At, at, I'll, I can't name, there's a lot of these projects out there that I can't talk about. I will talk about one that I can, <laughs> but um, because, and the reason I can't talk about them is because they haven't quite gone open source yet. And, but think of all the hyperscalers, the big companies that are doing scale operations. They're all moving to data services and staying away from databases. And mainly because of the messy details. 
Why not have a small core group of people that manage database operations? Like what if I want to migrate from one database to another? Um, or I want to migrate from one data center to another, um, you know, things like that. Or I need to do some operations on my database that gen generally will require me to have a negotiation with developers. No, just abstract the whole thing. As long as the API is online, everything's good. It gives you the ability to change things underneath. All right. There we go. Oops. So <clears throat> here are the three things that I would consider criteria for data services. Oops, back, back. You need to have on-demand scaling. You need to be elastic, meaning you just pay for what you need. So if it goes up, it goes down. And you need near 100% uptime. Um, these things give you that maximum flexibility with the minimum amount of trade-offs. And when you think about when you're building applications um, and you're having, uh, you're having these discussions built on this application build time, these are three things that you would really love to say, these are not the problem. Yeah, are we gonna have enough? Yeah, we'll get whatever we want when we need it. Is it gonna be online no matter where we are in the world? Yeah, should be up, no problem. That's what it's built to do. And then finally, is it gonna blow out our budget? Nope, it's not gonna do that because if we don't use it, it's gonna scale back down and we're not gonna to have to pay for it. Great, okay, moving on to the other thing, spaces or tabs. I'll let you figure that out for yourself. Um, but we have less of a, of a conversation around just data and man, I'll tell you, this could really make your life better. <laughs> now, open source is coming to the rescue on this one because uh, cloud databases um, have started to going down this route. And um, we know that, you know, there are cloud uh, serverless databases out there or data services that um, basically are there to lock you into their service. And it, it's pretty well known, you know, they, they want you in their walled garden. So if you're in cloud X and they have a very bespoke data service that works inside of their cloud, they know if you move your data into it, you're probably gonna be there for life, right? Because you know how it goes. Oh, someday we'll move our database to this other database and we'll be fine. That's no lock-in. Yeah, that's called technical debt and you're never gonna get out of that. Um, so this is what's been really fun to watch with Kubernetes is because we're virtualizing data centers and we can do this kind of stuff, like you know, create the entire application, including the data layer, we can move this thing around. So if I, you know, if, if I want to run in GCP, Amazon and Azure at the same time, totally fine. If I want to just run run at a time, totally fine. But it, the data portion is the key to portability and open source to the rescue. Open source helped us a long time ago. Um, I remember when I was back in the nineties, remember that um, I was working with, we, we had operating systems we had to pay for a lot. I mean, it was Solaris was not cheap, um, but you know, here comes Linux and it changed our scale equation. Like instead of installing one big server, we started installing tons of little ones and they were great. And because we were using Linux, open source changed the economics of it. Um, same with all sorts of infrastructure. Um, databases, MySQL, Cassandra, um, analytics like Spark, They've changed the, the, the whole game when it comes to the economics of scale. And same thing's gonna happen with data services. Now I work, um, like I said, with Kubernetes uh, quite a bit now. And this portability is really important, especially when it comes to building applications. Developers should be able to use their laptop. Uh, you could run it, you know, if you still have on-prem software or hardware, great. If you wanna run it in the cloud, great. All of those things, should work just fine and not have to be really super different. Like you should not have to say, well, I'm gonna deploy it on my laptop. It's gonna be completely different from what I'm gonna deploy in production. Using Kubernetes now, we have the ability to build not only what we need, but put it into a CI CD pipeline so that the configuration is stored in Git, our virtual data centers run in any place that we can run Kubernetes. So <clears throat> this, this e equation has changed quite a bit. 
Um, so I work on a couple of open source projects and I'm gonna kind of get into some like more specific examples. And this is why I'm really, one of the reasons I'm really passionate about it is because as someone who's been working with, um, with open source databases and uh, like Cassandra, um, MySQL for years, um, I'm seeing like, this is like the next wave is where we now take the data layer data services into Kubernetes and we just use all that good stuff that we've built over the years. Um, I don't think we need a new database, um, not at all. Um, there's lots of great databases out there that do lots of great things. But what I do think is we need a new relationship with our databases <clears throat> in a cloud native architecture. So um, I'm gonna go over some of these um, real quickly and just give you a highlight of what they do and why we're, you know, what these open source projects are about and why I think this is the right direction. So <clears throat> Stargate is a, not only a cool name for a project, but it also does things like uh, create HTTP APIs like REST, GraphQL, document APIs, and it even does native format, just like I was showing you before in another, uh, in another slide. But <clears throat> it, it is built for deploying on Kubernetes. Now, this gives you this a lot of options for developers. It gives you lots of options because you can just choose the right API or client or framework, and it it abstracts away a lot of stuff. And it's it's not easy because sometimes you have to think about um, what's under you know there is some thought when you deploy it about how you deploy it with your software or with your underlying database, but you know this is left up to the SREs. And if we can provide that as, or as SREs, our developers just are fine. They're gonna be just fine because they're gonna to wanna to use something like Node.js and a REST API or a GraphQL and not think about, oh, do I need to download a driver? Um, that's, don't need to do that. So <clears throat> it, it, re it really gives us the ability to separate out our traffic from our, our data traffic from the actual database itself. And they can scale independently. Um, and then as new APIs start popping up, we can add those and start building out this whole infrastructure. <laughs> the architecture right now for what uh, Stargate does is it has a, the first layer is, is basically just, uh, it accepts HTTP calls uh, from a variety of places and then negotiates with the underlying databases. Right now it uses Cassandra because that was the first implementation. Um, there are other databases that are in, in the pipeline, as they say. Um, there's other open source database projects that will, that will participate in Stargate and make those happen. Um, and that's the point of this is making it just so that we could have uh, a, a meeting place for databases to present themselves as a data service. And if you think about it in terms of like, this is very modular, just like how Kubernetes is very modular, um, we can build out all the different parts. And those parts are how we deploy things into our infrastructure. Um, just like as we build storage network and um, storage network and compute in Kubernetes, that's how we consume things. We can do the same things with our data layer. Um, the other project that I've been pretty heavily involved with is a project called Kate Sandra. And um, this is a little more into the database side for sure. Um, but what we're trying to do is take Cassandra and completely eliminate it as a, an operations problem and make it easier for people to deploy it into Kubernetes. But ultimately with the goal of making it so that it's just a data layer for Kubernetes. Um, you're not really thinking about what the database is. Um, yeah, I know the, the word Kate Sandra is a little bit of a mashup and it's cute, but um, you should be able to deploy it and have the three things that I talked about. You should be able to have an always on uh, elastic scaling, high scaling data service without a lot of work. Um, it's, it should be an SRE topic that's pretty simple and your developers should get what they need out of it. So the Things that are built on, um, we use an operator internally for Cassandra. Um, we, we use Stargate, so it implements Stargate to provide a data gateway. So when you deploy it, it has, um, it has all the services that you, your developers need. 
And then it uses, uh, it works with traffic in this case, but it works with others as well for Kubernetes ingress. Um, and then it has operations tools that run automatically in the background for all the operations tasks that normally you would have to do manually. Um, it does those automatically. And this is, when we put all this together with metrics and, and observability, you get a pretty usable package that you deploy pretty easily. Um, you just deploy it. Developers can use it any way they need to. You can deploy it anywhere. Um, and this is where open source really, look at every one of these things is open source. So if you want to deploy it on Amazon, you want to deploy it in Google, you want to deploy it on your laptop, totally cool. And it's portable and it's, you know, we have in open source, there's free as in freedom and free as in beer. This is free as in freedom. You don't have to be tied up into a certain walled garden. Um, you can you can move it around however you need to. And because these projects are all open source, you can also do a lot of manipulation and changes. Um, it's one of the things with Kate Sandra that's really exciting is it's a lot less about code contributions from the community. And if you look at the PRs, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot less about code and a whole lot more about configuration, um, deploying, you know, like how you deploy things. So it's, it's turning into a, like a collection area of SRE knowledge around deploying scale applications in Kubernetes. And then we use Helm eventually for a lot of this stuff to get deployed. Um, Helm makes it easy. It's right now this, it's the, the first class in the project, but um, we will, I think we'll see soon that it, it'll be departing. It'll split away from Helm. So the, the idea here is whenever you're building applications um, and if, if you think about like all the things that interact with your data layer, um, it's creating some abstractions inside of Kubernetes that allow for that to happen. So if your web and mobile apps, microservices, et cetera, need a data service, um, this will provide that in Kubernetes and it'll run on any infrastructure because it's just running in Kubernetes. Um, the, the keys are really just making sure that, you know, you have uh, a stable or Kubernetes cluster. And um, some of the knowledge that we are building now is around things like making good storage uh, choices, how to work with ingress, that sort of thing. So back to my slide. <laughs> so Stargate is kind of the tip of the iceberg in this case, where it's just like, here's the, here's this nice light little piece of ice floating on the water, nothing to see here. All that messy detail is handled automatically underneath through Kate Sandra. And this is an interesting, uh, this is what's interesting about this is that we're building out projects within projects. We're starting to wrap projects and projects, but um, Kubernetes is the destination for, I think all of our application infrastructure eventually, at least in the, in the next 10 years. And we're, we're really trying to make this a, a place where everyone can gather and bring knowledge and share and create a community around building data services. And no matter what underlying database you have, no matter what deployment infrastructure you're using. So that is all I have. And I promised I would leave plenty of room for questions. So I'm gonna do that real quick. All right, got a few, I got a few questions. I got one really good one. Um, and feel free to ask any questions you like in here. Um, I, uh, let's see, I'm gonna, should I, is my screen still sharing right now? It is, yep. All right, um, do you see my entire screen or do you see, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm showing anymore. It's the full, uh, presentation screen, the full PowerPoint screen. Okay, got it, okay. Um, do I have a series of sample projects based on this deployment? Um, well, uh, Kavita, you ask a good question. There are a lot of these parts like this, like I'm assuming that you're talking about like the Kate Sandra Stargate. Um, funny enough, uh, Datastax Astra, which is our, is Datastax, it's a Cassandra as a service, runs completely on this stack. <laughs> so we are 
we actually run this. Um, we have a <clears throat> we have a team, an open source team that <clears throat> spends a lot of time on it, but it's also being used to deploy our own service. So we not only believe in it, we <laughs> got a better company on it. Um, there are Yelp just did a really cool presentation lately. Uh, it was in a meetup in London, but it's on YouTube, of course. Yelp did one on how they use Stargate internally. Um, they're slowly migrating their things over to Kate Sander as well. Um, they're a big Cassandra shop. Um, there are a few others that have not been public yet, but they are coming soon. Um, for, uh, you know, but if you look on the Kate Sander website, there's, there is some discussion about like how, like different deployment scenarios and how you would deploy it in your infrastructure as well. Um, who are the main competitors to Stargate? Uh, it is the cloud databases. And this is one of the reasons we believe that open source would be a really good move for this particular thing. Um, and the reason being is that uh, when you're, like I said, the, like the Dynamo DBs, the Cosmos DBs, I forget what the one, I Google it, uh, Firestore, <clears throat> you know, they, these are really good databases. Um, there's nothing wrong with them, but they are specific to that cloud. And, you know, it's just like, there's nothing wrong with Oracle. Oracle's a great database, nothing wrong at all. Um, I made a great career building good stuff on it, but open source changes the economics and the dynamics of how you do your applications. And if you're looking at a cloud database in that, that, in the, in that space, then you're, yes, those are a competitor to what Stargate would be and you should look them in the same way. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, other open source projects that uh, probably are come along. Um, this is just starting to crack open. Um, I think that uh, Accio, I, Facebook has never open sourced that. They just keep talking about it. And I don't know if they ever will open source. I talked to that team several times. Um, they seem pretty happy just developing it internally and talking about it. I have, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so maybe someday I would love to see it out there just because I think we, it's an open source ecosystem really thrives on having a lot of different choices and different, different opinions. Um, I don't have a demo. Um, <clears throat> I don't generally, I should have a demo. <laughs> um, it, there are, there are a lot of, uh, workshops around this. If you were, you know, if you hit Google, look for a Stargate, um, Kate Sandra, uh, there's some workshops on actually how to do it. Um, and that's, that's something that our developer relations team does quite a bit of. Um, so information security, uh, good question. Um, and that is actually one of the reasons that data services, I, I didn't put it as a main reason, but it is definitely on the list of a good reason to have it. And so thinking of in terms of like uh, InfoSec when it comes to databases is I think one of the, it, it keeps um, CISOs up at night, <clears throat> mainly because you can break into a web server an app server, you know, if, if a if someone if a bad actor breaks into a web server or an app server, the the threat exposure is a lot lower than if they get into your database. And you know, that's if you hear about like the worst hacks out there, it's usually so and so got a hold of all the data in the database, and that's just horrible. Um, we uh, we we've looked at like how to do some of these things. First of all, from an inf information security abstraction is always the best plan. But what it does inside of like, for instance, with Stargate is it allows the implementation to maintain certain uh, security standards. So for instance, um, inside of Kubernetes deployment, you're gonna have a certain security stance already. Um, you're gonna have shared secrets and that sort of thing. But um, one of the things that Stargate enforces is things like TLS and making sure that everything is firewalled and no open ports. So, I mean, if you look at like some of the best practices of running a database, this is fitting into that realm pretty well. Um, so uh, let's see, next question. Does Kate Sander provide a feature for maintenance task? Yes, actually that is um, what, there's two projects, two Apache projects in there um, there's Reaper and Medusa, which are great Greek names. Um, they, uh, 
they are there to do operations on Cassandra in the back end, so you don't have to. Um, Reaper does uh, does repair maintenance, which is just part of an eventually consistent database, and Medusa does backups. Um, and there, you can as just part of your uh, deployment inside of Kubernetes, you can you can deploy it and specify how often you want those to run. Um, you can deploy with backups on and uh, destinations for backup files. So for instance, if you want to dump them into a, an object storage like S3 or something like that, um, all of those things should run automatically and it will give you the full observability in, you know, it pipes all this stuff out to Prometheus so you can, and Grafana, so you can look and see exactly what's happening, but mostly it's just set it up, run it, and it'll run itself. Um, Question was, MySQL is open source, and why do we have to move into Stargate or Cassandra? Um, yes, MySQL is an open source database. Um, my, uh, my proposition to you is why, and so is Cassandra. Cassandra is a database, but um, MySQL, Cassandra, I mean, there's all of these are open source, Postgres, but what I'm talking about right now is data services in a cloud native way. Uh, MySQL is a, uh, a database that can run in Kubernetes, but it does not run in the same way that Kubernetes wants to run. For instance, if you need a lot more MySQL, you, you can't just add more nodes. Um, it doesn't do active active replication. So for instance, it's, it's, it's hard to stay resilient. Um, there are ways to make it more resilient with like read replicas and things like that, but mostly the data services and I will tell you this, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if there was a MySQL implementation of Stargate soon. I'm just gonna, here's a little preview. So um, Stargate plus MySQL might be an option here pretty soon. Um, how long does this stack take to set up from scratch on a new project? Well, with a Helm install, uh, it's actually pretty easy. Um, I, I have it running on my local laptop right now. Uh, it, it takes about five or 10 minutes to, if you're completely scratched, to download all the containers, you know, get all the infrastructure going. Um, if you go to katesander.io, there's a getting started button um, and it will walk you through the basics. Um, if you're using something like Kind on your desktop or Minikube. Um, and I think mostly it's just the time required is how much time it takes for the, the containers to download. Um, and then when you're setting up an actual cluster like inside a Kate Sandra cluster, um, depending on the size, because we uh, per node, we put about a, a one to two minute delay on deploying each one just so to let everything inside Kubernetes settle down. So, you know, that that's how long to go. Um, from a from a developer standpoint, um, not very long. Um, we do a two hour workshop on Kate Sandra and Stargate, and you can go from zero to fully running application within two hours, which, and that's with a lot of explanation and blah, blah, blah. And, and we even play games in our workshops. So, um, so not very long. And that's the point is we want this to be a very fast and easy operation. And if it isn't, here's the thing I beg of you, please participate in the project by giving your opinion. We have a discord, um, there's PRs and issues on GitHub. Like if it's like, hey, you know what? This doesn't work the way I want it to, speak up. We would love to hear about it. That's what open source is about. And we, we really do value that kind of feedback and be a part of the project. Um, is there an option for dynamic data masking? No, not yet, but that's interesting because that, that fits inside of the security part. And this is actually something that I think will find its way here pretty soon, because this is something that um, uh, SREs especially are looking for. For instance, if I have a data service that's pulling customer information and I need to put a rule on it, say based on GDPR, um, I should be able to do that at the operation deployment level based on parameters and not leave it up to the developers. Cause you know what happens whenever we leave it up to developers, right? Yep, that's right, problems. Um, how many data centers do I have around the world? Uh, I don't have any data centers. <laughs> I read everything. Um, yeah, this isn't, this isn't a, uh, Astro just uses 
all the clouds. So wherever the clouds have data centers, that's where we are. Um, but it's up to you. Um, this is an open source project. You can deploy it anywhere you want. So, um, but that's an interesting question. Um, ML support, yes, thank you. Great questions. Um, so ML pipeline support is not there yet. However, um, there are some API considerations with this. Uh, I was just in a conversation this week about with somebody about um, using this as like Apache Airflow and that sort of thing. Um, because of where it sits inside of the infrastructure, um, it, it does lend itself to potentially being a part of an ML pipeline. Um, and I think a lot of that is implementation, like using Apache Pulsar, Flink, um, Airflow. I mean, there's, there's a few options in there where you can start seeing how this might fit in a Kubernetes deployment. Um, the, I, I'd say just stay tuned on this, but it, this, is, I, this has been a topic that's coming up, especially in the data mesh world. I don't know if you've been involved in data mesh yet, but, um, Kubernetes, data mesh, these are all topics that are starting to converge and uh, data services is a key part of that. All right, <laughs> any clue on the release of Cassandra 4.0? Oh, Pedro, yes, soon. <laughs> um, I will tell you uh, as someone who's just as inside as everyone else, uh, the there are only a couple of tickets left in beta four, and we're, I, I would suspect we're going to see a, a release candidate here pretty soon. Um, and those of you who don't know about Cassandra, um, the, the whole thing around Cassandra 4.0, it's been a long time since we've released a major release. And the reason being is because the biggest companies in the world that use Cassandra are spending a lot of time to make sure that it is the most stable database on the planet, period, because it runs the world's biggest workloads. So these are like the Alibaba's, the Huawei's, the Apple's, um, uh, Yahoo Japan. They're all really intimately involved with stability of this database. And so um, the, the project management committee will not release 4.0 until it is completely green on data, all the data, loss, data, governance, everything. So, and I think it's there. We actually have a lot of folks using Cassandra 4.0 beta 4 in production right now. If you go to the cassandra.apache.org, you'll see some of those. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's a, uh, uh, It'll be soon um, because we're just we're running out of things to break, and it's the first time I've seen any database this stable in my career. So that's my long answer. But yeah, thanks for asking. And I think we're out of questions, other than Happy St. Patrick's Day. Hey, Tristam, <laughs> that's not a question, is it? Okay, beautiful. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your time today. And thank you everyone so much for joining. Just as a quick reminder, uh, this webinar was recorded and it will be posted to the Linux Foundation YouTube later today. Hey, thanks so much, everyone. Bye.